Suppose that we have a function between two finite sets of the same size, size 3 for example. You'll remember that we have a way of drawing those functions, which is to draw some dots on the left to represent the domain of the function, and some dots on the right to represent the codomain, and then arrows to show where each element of the domain is sent by the function. So let's now suppose that this function is 1 to 1, which means that every one of those arrows must have a different target. For example, we might send the first dot here, and the second dot here, and then the last dot must go here. Well, in this case, there must be three different targets. And if there are three different targets, then everything is a target. So if this function is 1 to 1, then it's also onto. And this connection between 1 to 1-ness and onto-ness for functions on finite sets, in fact, from a finite set to another finite set of the same size, is going to be what we discuss in this video. So here's the big theorem we're going to prove. We take two finite sets, x and y, and a function f from x to y. We then have the following three results. First of all, if f is 1 to 1, then the size of x is less than or equal to the size of y. Secondly, if f is on 2, then the size of x is greater than or equal to the size of y. And finally, if f is a bijection, then the size of x is equal to the size of y. So we'll begin by proving um, the first statement. Before we do that, let's have some notation. So first of all, we take the size of x to be m, at some finite set, so m is a natural number, and we have some notation for the distinct elements of x. So let's let x be little x1 up to little xm, where those are the distinct elements in this set x. In that case, we can describe the image of the function f. That's just the set containing f of x1 and f of x2 and so on up to f of xm. So let's do the proof of part 1 here. Uh, we know that the image of f is a subset of y, and because f is 1 to 1, each one of these things, f of x1, f of x2, and so on, up to f of xm, those are all distinct from one another. So the image is a subset of y which has size m, because no two of the f of xi's are equal. And that means the size of y is at least m. In other words, the size of y is at least the size of x, which is precisely what we needed to prove. Moving on to the second one, let's suppose that f is on 2. Well, if f is on 2, then by definition of being on 2, the image of f is equal to y. But we already have a description of the image of f, which is that it is equal to the set containing f of x1, f of x2, up to f of xm. So that has size at most m, because there are m things in there. You know, maybe some of them are equal, so it might not have size exactly m, but it must have size at most m, because there are there are at most m different things in y. And that means y has size at most m, and so we get that the size of x is greater than or equal to the size of y. Finally, the third one follows immediately from the first two, because if it's a bijection, then it's 1 to 1, so the size of x is less than or equal to the size of y, and it's also on 2, so the size of x is greater than or equal to the size of y. And if both of those are true, the sizes must be equal. Here's another result on bijections on finite sets. So let's say we have a function f from a finite set x to itself. Then the following three things are equivalent. So first of all, f is surjective, secondly, f is injective, and thirdly, f is bijective. To say those are equivalent means that 1 implies 2, and 2 implies 3, and 3 implies 1. So if any one of those is true, then the others uh, are also true just by going around the circle of implications. To do our proof again, let's fix some notation. So we'll let x have size n. n is a natural number because x is finite. And we have some notation little x1 up to little xn for the distinct elements of this set capital X. So in our proof, we will show that 1 implies 2, 2 implies 3, and then 3 implies 1. So we'll begin here by showing that 1 implies 2. So let's suppose that f is surjective, and I have to then show that it's injective. If f is surjective, that means by definition that the image of f is equal to all of x. Now it can't be, for example, that f of x1 was equal to f of x2, because then the image of f, which 
as we saw on the last slide, could be described as the set containing f of x1, f of x2 up to f of xn, well that would also be equal to the set which just contains f of x2, f of x3 up to f of xn, because f of x1 was equal to f of x2 in repetition doesn't matter to the size of a set. If you count the size of a set, you're counting the number of distinct different elements. So this set has its size most n minus 1, since here we are having n minus 1 elements, uh, which some of which may be equal, but that's equal to all of the image of f. So similarly, f of i, xi, and f of xj can never be equal uh, when i is not equal to j, because for exactly the same reason, that would imply that the size of the image of f will be at most n minus 1, so it couldn't be all of x. It follows that f is injective. Let's now suppose for the second part that f is injective and prove that it's a bijection. So if we suppose that f is injective, then that means all of the elements f of x1, f of x2, up to f of xn are distinct from one another. So the image of f which consists of the set of those elements, has size n, because all of those things are distinct. Now that means the image is a size n subset of a size n set, so it must be the whole of the set x. And if the image of f equals x, then f is onto, so it's surjective. So we've established that f is surjective, we were assuming that it's injective, and therefore it's bijective. So that gives us that 2 implies 3, and finally, 3 implies 1 is just a matter of definition. Uh, if f is a bijection, then of course, by definition, it's surjective. So 3 always implies 1. So that completes the proof of this equivalence. Let's just end the lecture by noticing that this is not true for infinite sets. So let's think of an example for infinite sets. So, for example, if we have f... Let's have a different colour there. If we had f from z to z, so z is an infinite set given by f of, actually let's change my mind there, let's have the natural numbers here, so that's the set of numbers 0, 1, 2 and so on. Let's define this function to be f of little n equals n plus 1. And that function is injective, because if n plus 1 equals m plus 1, then you can subtract 1 from both sides to get n equals m. So it's injective, but it's not surjective, because the image doesn't contain 0. And equally, if we take g from n to n defined by g of 0 is going to be equal to 0, and g of n equals n minus 1 if n is greater than 0. Well, g is not injective, because g of 0 and g of 1 are equal. But g is surjective. Um, if you have any natural number m, then f of m plus 1 is equal to uh, g of m plus 1 is equal to m. So g has every natural number in its image. Therefore g is surjective and not injective. That shows that a function from an infinite set to itself can be surjective without being injective, and can be injective without being surjective, in contrast to what happens for finite sets.